Hi everybody, we're back today to discuss westward movement. I want to start with the situation in Texas. Now, um, Texas actually used to be under the control of the Mexican government. Mexico, which had achieved its independence from Spain in 1821, was seeking to increase immigration into the region known as Texas. And they actually even offered Americans to come settle in that region. So Stephen Austin, for instance, of which Austin, Texas, is named after, he got permission from the Mexican government to sponsor about 300 families to move, American families, to move into this region. Before long, though, the genie was out of the bottle. You have many, many more Americans uh, anxious for land to grow cotton on, for example, many southern slaveholders coming in, pouring into the region, some of them bringing their slaves with them. And in fact, by 1830, the Mexican government was very upset by the fact that by that time, Americans outnumbered the native Tejanos in that region by a factor of two to one. So they began hastily cutting off any, any more American immigration into this region. And Americans there weren't exactly very happy under Mexican rule either. They didn't like the requirement that they practice Roman Catholicism. The Mexican government had made them promise to do that. They didn't care for that. They also didn't like having to owe allegiance to what they considered to be a foreign government, that of, the Me of Mexico and not the United States. In fact, as early as 1826, an insurrection among Americans broke out. Uh, and what we're going to end up seeing is, is that, uh, you know, several American presidents actually try to buy the region of Texas from Mexico. First in 1825 under John Quincy Adams, and then again in 1830 when Andrew Jackson tried to buy the territory from the Mexican government. Mexico said no both times. They wanted to hold on to this region. So before long, sporadic fighting turned into a full-scale rebellion in 1836 amongst the Americans living in this Texas uh, or in this Mexican region. The Mexicans came out victorious at Goliad and, and at the Alamo, but ultimately, under the leadership of General Sam Houston, American forces prevailed, in, and Texas was able to achieve its independence uh, through uh, the Mexican leader, General Santa Ana, being arrested and forced to sign a document uh, giving the Lone Star Republic its, uh, its independence at that point. Well, we have several other land issues that successive U.S. presidents are also wrestling with, not just Texas, but if you'll notice on the map here, uh, Spain also, or excuse me, Mexico also controlled a huge amount of former Spanish territory, not just Texas, but the California territory, which included much more than the present day state of California, but much of the Southwest, Nevada, Utah, or, uh, Arizona, and New Mexico. The port of San Francisco was coveted for years as, as a great a gateway to the Pacific Ocean. So what you're seeing is interest building in the United States to go ahead and annex this land, to try and either purchase it from the Mexican government or find a way for the United States to continue spreading through this region. Also, the Oregon Territory. There were uh, disputes between U.S. settlers in that region and British settlers coming down from British Canada. So um, the Oregon Trail, for example, was also so highly prized because in many areas of, of the uh, Willamette Valley, you've got great conditions for growing crops. The American stake in the Oregon Territory was also reinforced by the fact that you've got thousands of travelers making their way to this region on the Oregon Trail, one of the most heavily traveled um, ways to get to this region. Another factor encouraging Americans to move westward was the concept of manifest destiny, which was an idea, actually a, 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 a term coined by a, a, a writer by the name of John L. O. O'Sullivan, who basically began arguing that it was, it was the destiny, it was the fate of the United States to spread from the Atlantic Ocean in the east to the Pacific Ocean in the West, and that it, it was providential that, that, in fact, God intended on the United States to become uh, a continent that, that spread from one ocean to another. So this, too, is kind of justifying some of the means by which the United States will begin acquiring territory uh, in the far West. The Mexican-American War um, really was triggered by President James K. Polk, 
who was elected to the presidency in 1844, at least in part based upon his campaign promises to get the California Territory, to get the Oregon Territory, to bring Texas in to the Union as a state. He will manage to do all those things. In fact, before war between the United States and Mexico commenced, he will go ahead and settle the Oregon boundary dispute with the government of, of um, Britain at that point in time so that the United States has uh, territory in uh, it, where its settlers already existed. Essentially, the Mexican-American War was engineered, meaning it was a, a, a created conflict. And it was created by President James K. Polk, who essentially sent in U.S. troops into Mexican territory south of uh, the Nueces River and basically provoked Mexican soldiers into firing on American soldiers. And that was how Polk kind of began to claim that American blood was shed on American soil, even though it wasn't American soil. It was Mexican soil. So the Mexican-American War um, will, uh, the ultimate upshot of that is, remember, Mexico is still a fairly young country. They've only had their independence now for about 20, 25 years since uh, Spain, the colonial power, had been uh, kicked out. So the United States, meanwhile, had a much larger and better trained military. So the Mexican-American War, as you can see, is a fairly, sh a fairly short duration. And it resulted in about 20,000 American casualties, but over 50,000 Mexican casualties. So the United States will, will prevail in this conflict and will ultimately manage to secure the California Territory. Uh, for a payment, a one-time payment of $15 million to the Mexican government. What we'll also see is, is right before the Mexican-American War begins, Texas will also enter into the Union as a slave state. So the United States at the end of the Mexican-American War have defeated a foreign power. They've, they've now added a tremendous amount of territory to the United States' boundaries, uh, about 1.2 million square miles of territory. So what this question, uh, the question that all this will beg is, is, what will happen to the institution of slavery in many of these new Western territories? What we're going to see is, is before the war, the first shots are even fired. You're going to see an anti-slavery congressman by the name of David Wilmot from Pennsylvania suggesting that in this upcoming war between the United States and Mexico, that should the United States win this conflict, that slavery be prohibited or kept out of any new territories gained from Mexico. This was known as the Wilmot Proviso. It was a little addition to a spending bill uh, that Congress was passing to uh, give the U.S. Army the funds that it needed to fight uh, Mexico. His proposal, though, was seized upon by southern slaveholders, and they cried foul, and his proposal died in Congress. It was never passed. But this gives us a little bit of an idea about how... Um, inflammatory this issue was between northern politicians and southern politicians. What we're going to end up seeing too is by 1850 with the discovery of gold in California the prior year in 1849 at Sutter's Mill we're going to see a massive rush of peoples out to California. California, therefore, is quickly turning from a territory into a potential state, into the Union. So the whole San Francisco 49ers, you know, that, that was the gold rush out to California. So California is about to enter the Union, and most people will assume that it's going to enter in as a free state, one that does not have slaves. But this is going to trigger yet another controversy in Congress. And the discussion that is brought up in Congress is exactly what members of Congress, senators and, and representatives, had hoped to avoid for some time. The issue of slavery was so divisive by this point, by the 1840s, that almost as soon as the word slavery was broached in any business being conducted on the floor of the House of Representatives or the floor of the Senate, that it brought an immediate standstill to all deliberations because immediately northern politicians are on high alert, southern politicians are on high alert, each one trying to guard their particular you know, uh, viewpoint on slavery. So we often refer to the gag rule in Congress. 
during this time period, during the, the 1840s and 1850s, the idea being that members of, con of the U.S. Congress kind of had an informal, unspoken agreement just to kind of avoid the topic of slavery. Don't even bring it up, because as soon as you do, it's going to bring all our proceedings to a halt, a grinding halt, a standstill. So um, the gag rule was kind of the what was understood during this period, just don't bring it up, act like it's not there, but it was. And the controversy over California coming in as a new state into the Union and the compromise of 1850 will force congressmen to bring up the one subject that they've been trying to avoid, slavery. So the word compromise here, we see it again. Um, both sides having to give a little bit to get a little bit, but neither side happy with the result. All right, so the compromise, California is going to enter into the Union as a free state. This makes abolitionist northern politicians happy. Makes southerners unhappy, of course. Um, Utah and New Mexico would be able to decide for themselves, though. They were going to let the residents on the ground uh, through the doctrine known as popular sovereignty. That just means the people's will, popular sovereignty. That they would let the residents of those regions decide for themselves. So for southern slaveholders, this was their foot in the door, that maybe in Utah, maybe in New Mexico, enough pro-slavery people would vote for it, that those states might come in as slave states. And in possibly the most schizophrenic um, portion of the Compromise of 1850, slavery as an institution would still be allowed in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. Um, but the slave trade, all the largest slave market in the United States during this period was in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. You would not be allowed to trade slaves in the nation's capital. Uh, this was, the slave trade being banned in the nation's capital was for the benefit of northern politicians who were embarrassed, rightly so, when they had to ho host foreign dignitaries and they had to bring them into the nation's capital where human beings were being treated as animals, being traded like livestock. So the slave trade is banned in D.C. But the institution of slavery itself, to keep Southerners happy, was still to be allowed within the city limits. And then also to keep Southerners happy, a new, tougher fugitive slave law will be enacted, which will now force anyone hosting a free slave to give that slave up and have it be uh, sent back to the South. If they did not, then they were in violation of a federal law in which they could be fined a significant amount of money and also be jailed. And so for from the standpoint of Southerners, they, they wanted help recapturing runaway slaves, and they're going to force, through this new fugitive slave law, they're going to force Northerners to comply. Of course, many Northerners will not comply. Uh, many uh, free blacks, many uh, Northern whites will go ahead and go to jail uh, rather than help Southern slave catchers recapture uh, slaves and send them back into the cruel ties of bondage. So the Compromise of 1850 is explosive. It's barely agreed upon by both sides. And in fact, the whole package itself is sent line by line through Congress. It's not agreed upon as, as, a, as a full package. Stephen Douglas of Illinois instead has to send these proposals, each one individually, and have them be voted on. So this is the, the stance of northern abolitionists, southern slaveholders, is hardening. Each side is becoming less and less inclined to work peacefully with one another over these topics. And in fact, as early as, as 1850, you have states like South Carolina um, talking about the S word, secession. The governor of South Carolina proclaimed, for instance, that there was, quote, not the slightest doubt, unquote, that South Carolina would eventually secede from the Union over the issue of defending slavery. Also, <clears throat> added, adding into uh, all the furor over the issue of slavery in the United States will be the publication of Harriet Beecher Stowe's abolitionist novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, in 1852. Stowe's work um, is, uh, was so significant because it will lead many northern whites to begin sympathizing with the main character in the book, who was a slave by the name of Tom, a very devout slave who was sold multiple times and will ultimately uh, land in the hands of a cruel overseer by the name of Simon Legree, a man who demands his obedience, and Tom, uh, you know, is obedient up to a point. Uh, uh, Legree will ultimately end up killing uh, this innocent man uh, uh, in the novel. 
There's also a subplot about a runaway slave by the name of Eliza who's seeking her freedom. But throughout this book, um, Stowe will really kind of emphasize the horrors of slavery, how innocent individuals were beaten cruelly and treated savagely and sometimes killed, um, all to service uh, the economic needs of a slaveholding elite in this region. And this book will become an international bestseller. It will be translated into multiple uh, languages. And reportedly, upon meeting the author in, uh, at the start of the Civil War, uh, even Lincoln acknowledged that her book was a huge help in the 